Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, also known as NAPOF, it is my pleasure to welcome each of you. I'm Yvonne Su, NAPOF's Chief Policy and Government Affairs Officer, and I'm joining you virtually from Washington, DC. For those of you joining NAPOF for the first time, the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum is the only multi-issue community organizing and policy advocacy organization for Asian American and Pacific Islander women and girls in the United States. An important pillar of our work at NAPOF is building a data-driven movement by producing cutting edge research that is for us, by us, we know that Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities, let alone AA and NHPI women, are historically underrepresented in research. This lack of representation in research results in the misunderstanding of challenges facing our community, or our community completely being left out of important conversations and public policies that impact our everyday lives. In many ways, our research goals at NAPOF prioritizes and aims to illustrate a more accurate picture of the lived experiences of AA and NHPI women and girls across the country. To that end, today we'll present and discuss findings from our latest report on the current state of safety for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander women in the United States. For many of us, this past month has been a heavy reminder of the tragedy of the Atlanta spa shootings that took place just last year, that took lives, the lives of eight victims, including six Asian American women. And yet we not only remember this unimaginable tragedy one year ago, but we are reminded of the tragedies of earlier this year and even just last month. Today's briefing is also being recorded and will be shared out to our email listserv. For those of you who aren't able, who aren't already on our email listserv, please visit www.nopof.org to join. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Nopof's Executive Director, Sung Young Choi Moro, who will talk about our safety report as well as present major findings. After Sun Young's presentation, she will be joined by our special guest, Senator Tammy Duckworth. If you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A window, not using the chat function. We will, be, we will do our best to answer as many of the questions that we get during our Q&A session with Senator Duckworth. Thank you. Sun Young. Thank you, Yvonne. And thank you everybody for being here today um, for our briefing um, of this really important report that we put together. Um, so just before we get started, just wanted to you know, give some context that you know, as we thought about um, moving coming into March this year and it being the first um, you know, remembrance of the Atlanta spa shooting, um, we, we decided at the last year that, you know, while there'll be a lot of conversations and people wanting to talk about the remembrance, we thought it was as important to continue the conversation about the state of safety for Asian American women now. Um, and so we conducted the survey. The findings are, um, there, there's some findings, some of this finding that I find, it's like even news to folks like us who do this work, you know, day in and day out. And there's a lot that we still need to do together as a community and as allies and advocates. So. Um, I'm really excited to share our data with you and spend some time with you all in conversation today. So to start off um, our, um, yeah, so we, we did this polling and we're, you know, the report is called the State of Safety for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander women in the US. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, and I just wanna say that this is a, um, an effort, a joint effort, uh, supported by the Asian American Foundation and the Korean American Community Foundation. So we wanna thank them for being a part of 
uh, making this report possible. So just give you a little background. Um, I, you know, I give a little background about like the impetus for the report itself, but just a little background about safety issues for AA and HPI women. Um, it's not a new issue in the pandemic. You know, I think one of the things that uh, people are most surprised by is when I'm being asked about like COVID related violence or, you know, the surge of violence against Asian Americans since COVID that I tell them stories of violence um, that Asian Americans and especially Asian American women um, have experienced long before COVID came around and sort of the the beginnings of how we came to where we are. Like what are the stereotypes? What are the attitudes and behaviors towards Asian American women, especially um, AA and HPI women that have led to the data that we found today, right? So some of that is, you know, historical context, like this, this is a picture of uh, the first ever Chinese um, immigrant woman to be um, recorded in the United States. Her name is Afong Moi, and she was brought over in um, in the 1700s by a Chinese uh, by a New York businessman who wanted to make money off of her. Right, so she was put on display, and people could come pay him money and watch her, look at her hair, her skin, her small feet, the way she uses her chopsticks the way she talks Chinese, and it was a form of entertainment. Um, and so from, from the beginning of time when um, Asian women were introduced um, in the United States, there was this idea that we're here for people's consumptions, for people's curiosity, for people's entertainment. And that, you know, and obviously beyond that, we've had other harmful stereotypes that are perpetuated in, in, in entertainment, um, as well as, um, what, you know, the, the byproduct or the consequences of um, U.S. militarism in the Pacific Asia that continue to perpetuate the stereotypes that Asian American women are dealing with, um, living with, such as hypersexualization of our community or, uh, you know, um, stereotypes that were docile and submissive um, that, you know, we, we can be easy, easy targets. Um, so just moving along, I mean, I kind of covered the, the next slide already. Sorry, I should have prompted you to change the slides. Um, so why, why we want to focus on um, safety? Um, again, you know, as we've seen, the numbers of reports of hate crimes have increased since last year. Um, in, according to Stop API Hate, they've received an increase of 339% of reports um, in the last year. San Francisco, city of San Francisco put out data in February that they've seen an increase of over 500% in reporting um, of hate incidences in the city of San Francisco. Um, there are over 10,000 hate incidences against APIs reported between 2020 and 2021 and Asian American women face a disproportionate burden of the anti-AAPI hate. Um, according to Stop AAPI Hate, 62% of all incidences reported are reported by women. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I wanna point out about our survey as we go into this background is that you know, um, the data that I just shared with you about 60% of the self-reporting is done by women. What you will find in our finding is that, you know, we did a polling, which means we surveyed Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander women living in the United States. So this isn't self-selecting in to report something, but this is us going out to the community more generally and asking the question. And you will see that, you know, the, the data is um, pretty significant around the number of Asian American, the Hawaiian Pacific Islander women that are impacted by issue of harassment and discrimination. So a little bit about the survey design and background. And again, um, for those of you interested, the whole report is available on our website. So just wanted to say that up at the top in case um, folks wanted to take notes or, or make notes. Um, the survey um, was conducted by the Harris Poll on behalf of NAPOF between January and February of 2022. 
um, two, over 2,400 self-identified Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, adult women interviewed for, from every region of the country. And the survey was conducted online and by phone in English and five Asian languages. And the major findings are presented in these um, ethnic subgroups. So when we talk about East Asian, um, we are including Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Taiwanese. We talk about South Asians, it's Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, and Sri Lankan. And Southeast Asians are Filipino, Vietnamese, Cambodian, Hmong, Thai, Laotians, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander um, include Samoan, Marshallese, and Chamorros. The key demographics of survey respondents, um, this is the, the ethnic uh, breakup of who was surveyed. 32% were East Asian, 28 were Southeast Asian, 20 were South Asian, and 19% were NHPIs. I just want to make a note that we oversampled for NHPIs. That means that we collect a sample that's bigger than the representation of them in the population so that we could have uh, disaggregatable data um, as we continue to do more cross, cross tabulations with our data. Median age of respondents were 37, and the range was between 18 and 89. Education attainment, 9% had less than high school, 39% had a high school, has a high school degree, and 52% have college or more um, uh, uh, educational attainment. Um, country of birth, 55% are US born, and 45% who participated in the survey are foreign born. And in terms of region, 19% um, of the participants are from the Northeast, 10% from Midwest, 28% from the South, and 43% from the West. So I want to share um, some highlights and major findings from our report. And again, the full report is available online if you want to read more details. The first uh, statistic that I want to share is that 74% of the respondents reported personally experiencing racism and or discrimination in the last 12 months. What's really significant to note here was that there is no statistically significant difference by ethnic subgroups. Based on what you see in the news, you would think that East Asians were being mostly impacted, but this data shows that AA and HPI women are experiencing racism discrimination across the board and high numbers. Um, I mean, this is three in four respondents saying that they're experiencing racism or discrimination in the last 12 months. Top locations um, where people have experienced harassment or discrimination are in public spaces, such as restaurants and uh, shopping centers, uh, mass transit, such as trains and planes, and, and and then it goes down to you know, workplaces, one's neighborhood, um, and then online and by phone. Um, you know, I think it's really significant to know um, how, like the combination of mass transit and public space make up the vast majority of where people are experiencing harassment and discrimination. So it is definitely a public safety issue. Um, and then we also asked questions more specific to sexual harassment. 38% so of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander women reported experiencing sexual harassment in the last 12 months. And here the data, there is a bit of um, uh, difference um, by subgroups. And so we thought it was important to lay that out. So NHPI community, um, women in the NHPI community experienced the highest level. So 52%, so the, of, the, of the 32, sorry, so 52% of the respondents um, who answered that they had experienced sexual harassment um, were from the NHPI community, and then 40 from South Asian, and then 37 from Southeast Asian, and then 35 from East Asian community. 25% uh, reported not knowing their perpetrator. So again, being uh, subject to um, harassment by a stranger. And this is the, the percentage breakdown. Again, there's some slight variance in the ethnic subgroups of who's experiencing the most with 
Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders experiencing, 32% of them experiencing sexual harassment perpetrated by people they don't know. Um, in the next slide, uh, we asked folks where they were experiencing sexual harassment. And again, um, this was the breakdown of you know, where people said they were being sexually harassed. And this is, again, you know, notably public space um, is where it happens the most. And then online and mass transit following uh, uh, closely after that. And then we also asked a question about physical violence. And so 12% of the respondents said that they are experiencing some form of physical violence in the last 12 months. And there are some significant differences across subgroups. And so here's the breakdown um, of the subgroups who responded um, saying that they experienced physical violence. I'm, you know, as we go through some of these different forms of harassment and violence that we, you know, that our community is experiencing, um, one of the things that we, we, we are taking away is there's definitely a need to do follow-up, right? Like, um, so just keep in mind that this was a poll that we were asking people to fill out a survey. And so we're limited to how many questions we can ask before we start losing people and getting incomplete surveys. So we were limited to asking these very broad questions, but there's so much here that we want to further explore. Um, and we're hoping to be able to do that, um, you know, in the future with additional opportunities when, when they do arise. Next, I want to share that 40% um, of AA and HPI women reported feeling less safe today than compared to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Another 40% said their late level of safety has not changed since the start of the pandemic. And I think this is, again, significant to note because um, this is a question where we would love to delve deeper to, right? Was their level of safety already not, you know, did we not feel safe already before the pandemic? And based on some anecdotal work that we've done, especially around um, misogyny and sexual harassment that, you know, in the gender justice space, that we know that Asian American women weren't already safe, feeling safe to begin with. And then the pandemic just exasperated the situation for us, right? And so while only, I mean, not only, but 40% is significant, right? That 40% of our respondents say they feel less safer today. I also want to note that our starting point wasn't that many of us were starting to, were, were feeling safe in the first place. And there are some significant differences across subgroups in this category with East Asians um, by far feeling the most, um, you know, increase in, in level of, um, or lack of safety. Uh, from a year ago. The next data to me is really significant. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's about our mental health, right? 71% of A and HPI women reported feeling anxious or stressed due to fear of discrimination, harassment, and violence. Uh, this is pretty significant. And again, um, I want to note that there, is, there was no statistically significant difference by ethnic groups that AAPI women, by and large, seven out of 10 women are feeling anxious and stressed. So we asked folks about their perception of um, whether enough was being done by elected officials to address um, the issue of anti-AAPI hate. 29% of the respondents believe that their local elected officials have sufficiently addressed anti-API hate. And as you can see, um, this is a breakdown below. I think what's really interesting to note is, you know, the number of people who say, I don't know, right? Again, I think that there's room for exploration. Is it that they don't like, you know, I'm very curious to know what it is that they don't know. Is it that they don't know if it's been sufficiently addressed, or is it that they don't know if it, their elected officials have done it a good job? Like, there's a lot to explore there about wh whether it's a gap in information or whether it's you know they really just have no sense of whether it's 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 enough or not. Um, with Biden administration, there was a seven. 
percent increase in people feeling that the Biden administration sufficiently addressed anti-AAPI hate. And again, you can see the breakdown across um, the subgroups and there is a bit of variance. And 90% of AA and HPI women agree that elected officials need to better understand the intersectional experience of AAPI people. Um, when, uh, AAPI people have with discrimination, harassment, and violence. So we ask this intersectional question in our surveys because uh, we often like to understand if, you know, people think it's one thing or another. And it's really evident to us when we survey a Asian American Pacific and the women that intersectionality really matters to them. So um, we need to, you know, like, Part of what we are advocating for and, and our community wants us to do more of is for elected officials to understand how uniquely these issues impact us because we're Asian American and we are women or because we're an HPI and we are women. So it's not just about whether it's a racial issue or a gender issue, but the intersection of it that we want um, elected officials to understand better. And we asked a question, um, we framed it as agree or disagree. And so we asked this question um, to our respondents if they agree or disagree that elected officials need to invest more resources in, di in directly impact the communities to compact, combat AAPI, anti-AAPI hate. And 90% respondents said that they, they believe that that's true, um, that we need more investments made in our community. And again, you know, there's opportunity here, you know, if we could do focus groups or further study about what else folks want to see elected officials do. So here are some major takeaways. Um, and just in summary, again, close to 75% of AA and HPI women reported experiencing discrimination or racism in the last 12 months. So that's three in four people. 70% of AA and HPI women's mental health was impacted due to the fear of gender and or race-based discrimination, harassment, and or violence. Fewer than 40% of the respondents believe that the Biden administration has concretely addressed anti-API hate. And 90% of the respondents agree that elected officials need to do a better job of understanding intersectional experiences of our community when it comes to discrimination, hate, and violence. And 90% of AA and HPI women agree that elected officials need to invest more resources into directly impacted communities to combat anti-API hate. So um, that's the end of the presentation of the briefing itself. And now um, I will be joined by actually my senator. I love, I love introducing uh, Senator Duckworth because I get to say my senator, because I get to uh, live in this great state of Illinois and uh, be represented by a fierce uh, Asian American woman. Senator Duckworth, welcome. It's so good, good to, to see here. you. Thanks for, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Um, so I just want to do a short introduction here. Senator Duckworth was elected to the U.S. Senate um, in 2016 after serving two terms uh, representing Illinois' 8th Congressional District. Um, Senator Duckworth is an Iraq War veteran, Purple Heart recipient, and former Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of Cultural Affairs. And through her career in public service, Senator Duckworth has remained a fierce advocate for her fellow soldiers, including female, Native, Na female and Native American veterans, as well as working families and mothers. Thank you so much for making time for us today and joining this conversation. You've been such a trailblazer in so many ways. And um, we're just so excited to hear your perspective and take on the data that we've just shared. Um, and just wanna remind our listeners um, that if you have any questions to please put it in the Q&A window uh, not the chat function, but the Q&A window, and we'll do our best to get to them. So 
Senator, the first question to you, what was the most surprising thing you learned from the safety report and what didn't surprise you? Well, it's not, I guess for me, it wasn't that it was surprising. It was just really sad that it reinforced and the numbers are far higher than what anecdotally I had been hearing. I mean, I mean, first, let me just say that I want to thank the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum for all of the work that you've put into this report. It's really critically important to have the data that we can reference as we push to advocate uh, for AA and HPIs uh, in this country. Um, your advocacy and your research are giving uh, AA and HPI women across the country, regardless of their language skills or the immigrant status, it gives them the platform to tell their stories. And so that data is really important because a lot of folks can't, can't tell their stories themselves or not, do not have that platform. I also just want to recognize, you know, um, why it's not surprising is the fact that it's been incredibly painful for the past two years uh, within the AA and HPI community, um, you know, starting with, uh, a little over two years ago with the beginning of the crisis um, and along came all the increases in violence against the AA and HPI community. And we knew that was happening anecdotally. We'd seen anti-Asian hate happen um, time and again, you know, um, when President Trump did his anti-Muslim ban, when there were things, you know, you started seeing Sikh Americans come under attack and so, but as the pandemic went along, as Trump officials started using terms like Wuhan virus and really stoking hate, the interesting thing, um, sadly, that came out of it was how targeted AA and HPI women were, especially elderly AA and HPI women. And you know, tragically, a lot of your report seems to verify what we already knew um, anecdotally, just with our own lived experiences as AA and HPI women. Um, I'm really impressed by the resiliency and the strength of our community. Um, I'm gonna keep pushing for protections and empowerment for the community. Um, and I'm really eager to keep working with you on this issue. But unfortunately, I wasn't that surprised. Mm -hmm. If anything, I was, I, mean, I was surprised at how high it was, but then when I started thinking about it, I was like, no, it's not that high because everybody I talk to can tell me a story of someone in their family, my own mother, you know, being harassed at the grocery store by a grocery store employee. And, and so when, I start, when you start thinking it through, you're like, Actually, this is a pretty universal experience within the AA and HPI community, especially among women. Yeah, yeah. I think when you see the number, like the statistic, it's like shocking. But then you're right. Like everybody, we like I don't know an Asian American woman who hasn't had some sort of experience, or their mother hasn't had some sort of experience. To your point. Um, so yeah, that's a good way to sum it up. That it was, it was shocking because. The data, but not shocking because we all knew the stories. Right, it's shocking. Um, you see it in black and white, but then you're like, yeah, that's right. right. But it's still right. a smiling face. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so I think one of the things that strikes me is, you know, the self-reporting says only 67% of Asian of the reporting is made by women, but our our survey shows that 74% of women are experiencing this. Right. So it's even more than you know, what the self-reporting is saying, which is, I mean, it, it is it is just all over the place. Um, so how do you think, Senator, um, does gender bias and discrimination play a role against um, AA and HPI women? Oh, definitely. It, it, it shows up in all sorts of places. Uh, we know that um, uh, women of color uh, uh, are not believed when we go to the doctor, we're not listened to. Um, my mother, I remember she, my mother is allergic to penicillin and she had an operation and she tried to tell the doctor, you know, she was allergic to penicillin. Her English is not that great. Um, and they didn't listen to her and they gave her penicillin. She went into shock, almost died. You know, that unfortunately, tragically is, is a common experience because um, uh, uh, ANHPI women are not as listened to. We're not given as much um, we don't occupy a position of high influence within American society. It makes no sense, but 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 we don't. And, and so, you know, we, we get talked down to a lot by positions, people in positions of power, especially police officers and healthcare professionals and the like. Um, unless you happen to be talking to, you know, a healthcare professional who's Asian, then, then you may be able to have a connection. Um, but uh, I think the gender really does play a role against Asian women. And then within our own communities itself, um, Asian women, you know, have been 
in traditional society have been taught to make things better, smooth things over, deal with the problem, solve the problem. And so we are less likely to be the ones, that's why to report a lot of these crimes against us. We would rather, let's just, you know, yeah, somebody harassed me at the grocery store, but I'm just gonna go ahead and finish what I'm doing, put up with it so I can get the ingredients to make my family dinner, right? And, and they just keep on going. And, and, and um, A and HBI women have had this traditional role um, where we are the caretakers of the family and we, and we just keep things moving, no matter what pain we feel, no matter what burdens we feel, it's, we keep on going, especially when, then when you start to getting, um, you know, not just the moms, but the eldest daughter, um, you have that additional uh, burden that comes on it. So, so there is, you know, both a cultural and a gender and it all sort of comes together. Um, that I think makes AANHPI women more vulnerable um, uh, and, and more targeted to be victims of, of hate crimes. That, those are all so true. And yeah, I, I, I personally deeply feel what you're saying. Um, and so just a little bit more of a personal question. How has stereotypes about Asian American women shaped your experience in elected office? Um, you know, I think for me, it was less in elected office as it was my life before, because I came into elected, I think that my my path into elected office is different than a lot of um, uh, AANHPI women's path into elected office. So I come here as a military veteran, right? And I come here as an advocate for, um, for veterans and the military community. So you don't get much more macho than that community. And so I have this other identity that helps to buttress me I think it, it certainly helped me win statewide elected office in Illinois. If I had just been uh, an ANHPI woman who had not served in the military, I don't think I could have won mm. elections in Illinois as the first federally elected Asian woman, uh, woman in Illinois, right? And, and so that military status gave me mm. a, a status that I could rely on so that people would listen to me. And then when they listen to me, they're like, oh, wow, yeah, she knows what her, she's talking about. She understands me, right? But if you are an ANHPI woman and you don't have that military or police background, you know, it makes it that much harder. And then there's this whole stereotype of more subservient, more quiet, not willing to, you know, and so that when we do speak up, it's seen as being against type and we're seen almost um, as shrill. I mean, in fact, I actually had the, I was called shrill in my first campaign um, uh, by my opponent. Now they use all the dog whistles and, mm -hmm. um, you know, they tried to otherize me even as a military veteran um, and, and I had to fight back, but I had some basis on which to fight back on, which I think a lot of other AANHPI women when they run for political office or when they get into political office have a hard time, have a harder time asserting themselves because just by asserting yourself, you're seen as going against type. Um, and, and it's almost more negative in a way when you're just doing the same thing that anybody else to your left and your right, fellow representatives, fellow Congress people are doing but for somehow for you, it's unseemly just because you're Asian. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I mean, in some ways it's like your ability to have this other stereotype helped kind of level out this negative stereotype that would have not let you be where you are, right? So it's sort of, it, it's like this double enforcement, right? Like you needed this other thing to help negate your the stereotype people would normally have about Asian Asian American women um, and that you were respected because of this other you know career experience that you had um, and because otherwise void of that you would have had to face all of the stereotypes that and may, and maybe you do I mean just in the small you know few bits you've just shared here even that there is that, right? That when you speak up or when other women of color, you know, members of Congress, I mean, they've been called all sorts of things, right? Like, but when men do it, it's, yeah, they're just doing their jobs, right? I have one additional valuable tool in my toolbox and that is status as a veteran that I can use when, when people start to negate my voice in, in, in a setting. I, I put on my, my army veteran persona and that takes over. Um, and so, you know, I have that in my toolbox and I think a lot of, um, you know, AANHPI women when they get elected to the office don't have that persona um, mm -hmm. to rely on. And so 
you, you know, I, what I urge is, you know, develop your own mechanism for asserting yourself. And that was something that Speaker Pelosi really pushed very hard uh, when I was in the House to really um, uh, force the status quo to change so that the female reps were listened to. Because a lot of times we would be, mm. and, and so she, you know, when I was a freshman in the House, she um, selected me to be her representative to my freshman class, which is a very prestigious thing. But so I got to go to the leadership meetings. I've been in these leadership meetings with these, you know, very senior congressmen and congresswomen. And when she would ask a question, we would go around the, the table answering what we thought on a particular issue. Um, and you would get, always get a woman who would say something. And then the question, you know, people would go oh, nod their heads and keep going on. And then a man, three, pers- three people down would say the same thing the woman said. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, that is really good. I mean, we were, you know, and, and Speaker Pelosi was very good about stopping the conversation right then and there. And like, that's great, Michael. But Sally said that first. And let's go back to what Sally had to say. So she really enforced that. Um, but you could even see it among Democratic Congress people that we were playing out these old mm-hmm. dynamics that exist in our society at large. And even though we were very, you know, we should be more aware, it was happening even with leadership. Wow, that's a really powerful story. I mean, it, it, like you said, you're experiencing that with folks that are really fighting for these values. Um, what are the rest of us experiencing at, you know, our whatever sectors we're in, right? And so that's um, that's a really powerful story. Um, and I'm so glad that you've, you've had those uh, mentors and coaches and people invest in you to kind of help you figure out how to have your voice and gain your voice. And I, I'm grateful for those people in my life too, but uh, I hope we can work to create a world where we don't need that anymore. We don't need these extra tools, right? That, that we, are, we are an equal level playing field. And I think a lot of the work that you do and we've done together really is making those small inches closer to that. So I really appreciate that. I mean, just back to, um, you, you spoke about this a little bit when you talked about your mom, but just wanting to hear um, just a little bit more about if you've had any personal, if your per- personal perception of safety has changed during the course of the pandemic and what that's been like? Well, it is very much tied to my mother. Um, uh, really, I'm very, my mother's 80 plus years old, still very independent drive. She moved in with us during the pandemic. Um, she's helping take care of my two daughters who are four and seven. You know, she's yai yai to them. The Thai word for mother's mother is kunyai yai. So we call her yai yai. Um, and it's also funny because it's a close alliteration of the Thai word for big, which is yai. So, you know, she's the, she's the big person in our family. That, um, so it's a little bit of a, 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 a funny joke. Um, but, but she still goes to the grocery store, you know, and, 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 and she, this one time she went and um, she does a lot of coping mechanisms. Like if she's talking to me on the phone, at the grocery store, if I'm with her, she'll talk to me, speak with me in English. Like she'll speak to English instead of speaking in Thai to me, which is what we normally speak. Um, you know, she will, um, so a lot of, you know, coping mechanisms like that so that she isn't targeted. Um, and she doesn't even do it thinking about it. It's just instinctively, she just knows it's safer for me if I speak in English here. Um, and um, so we, so she was at the grocery store we're trying to buy some grapes at the beginning part of the of the virus um when you know there was still the wuhan stuff and people were blaming asians and it's if you guys would stop eating bats you know you wouldn't pass this virus on the world and all of that crazy stuff um and uh, one of the grocery store workers just kept shoving her out of the way she was trying to pick out the best grapes you know because asian moms right you can't, you can't pick the first bunch of grapes you got to go through all the grapes to find the you know the one bag of grapes that's the perfect bag for her granddaughter um, and, and kept pushing her away. And so she moved over and she, you know, and finally the woman is like, just, you know, just go away. I, I have to wear this mask because of you, you know, and the, the, the grocery store worker was wearing a mask. And my mother was just like, looked at it and said, listen, I'm not here to start a fight with you. I'm just here to buy grapes for my daughter. Mm-hmm. And when she came home, that really scared me. Mm-hmm. And as I see more and more elderly Asian women being pushed, um, you know, in front of buses and just walking down the street randomly, just getting hit. That to me um, really changed my personal perception of safety for my mother, mm. because you could just be out there grocery store in the grocery store shopping, trying to buy some grapes, and someone could come up behind you and just smack you or, or, or hurt you, and you would never even see it coming. 
and, and, and it be, suddenly became pervasive. And so I started, you know, going grocery shopping with my mom, which pissed her off because she wants her to go by herself. <laughs> she doesn't need me schlepping along next to her, you know? Um, so it, it changed the dynamic of how we did things in the family. And, and for me, it was really scary. Um, so I told my mom, just, just go shopping at H Mart, okay? <laughs> Where it's a little bit safer, you know, just, just go there more than anywhere else. And if you need to go to the other grocery store, wait and I'll go with you. Um, we shouldn't have to do that in America. But we are. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. That's yeah, my it's it's especially challenging when we think about our parents, our elderly parents. And that's just such a heartbreaking story. So I'm really sorry that your mom's had to go through that and you know that you know that's it it's impacting you and where you're how you're spending your time. And yeah, I think you know older Asian moms, like they like their independence. You know, I, I, I have the same conversation with my mom. Too. I'm like, don't like, there's a grocery store half a mile from my house and she wants to walk there for exercise and then lug all this groceries back as exercise. I'm like, do not like, just watch her the but, And she wants to go every day. Because yeah. I yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, right. want to go every day. Yes, I do. <laughs> because you know? I want, and then, and then it's like well then I'll just go if you don't want to go every day then I'll just go right and then you're like no but it's not safe so oh my goodness it's a huge burden on so so many of us and you know I, I want to acknowledge that especially as Asian American women who are also caring for our elderly that's it you know it, it is a added burden right of the mm -hmm. the the mental stress of worrying about our safety, worrying about our parents. Um, and so I just want to appreciate that as well. Um, before we get to the last question to you, Senator, I just want to remind um, the folks who are participating in this webinar, if you have any questions, to put it in the chat. Um, so for our last question to you, Senator, what do you think is the role or what is the role of elected officials to addressing anti-Asian violence that we're seeing that's only increasing, unfortunately? Well, I think there's several several things that need to happen. Um, one, we have to shine a light on it, right? We have to call it out for what it is and shine a light on it and 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 focus the attention of the nation uh, on it and, uh, and to recognize and say, hey, this is happening. Because if we didn't do that, people wouldn't know that it was happening. And then we have to follow that up by forcing law enforcement to acknowledge that it's happening and forcing law enforcement to go back and look at how they're classifying anti-Asian violence. Because what was happening was law enforcement was just classifying a lot of this violence as just theft or robbery. Somebody was just mugged, but they weren't classifying it as anti-Asian violence because the person didn't say a racist term when they were conducting the, the mugging. However, if you are choosing your victim based on their race, that's a racist, that's a crime, that's racist, right? So we are forcing law enforcement to go back and look. And so one of the things we did was to make sure that the Justice Department is going back and re-looking at crimes that were committed against Asian Americans and, and re-looking and, and to see if there's a race factor in them. So we get better data and, and, and to also train law enforcement officers across the country to better ask questions and identify a, a, a crime that is based on racism against Asian Americans in particular, because they were not classifying them as such. Um, they were classifying them as hit and run, harassment, you know, elderly abuse. But but when when it's only an Asian woman that's being targeted, then then that has to be classified as anti-Asian violence. So that's one thing that's sort of like the official executive branch thing that we can do. Um, we also need to work um, through the legislative branch in two ways. One is through funding, you know, to, to appropriate money to fund both executive branch uh, to train law enforcement, but also to provide funding to local communities so that they can implement solutions within their communities to help, um, uh, you know, fight this violence. The other is to pull together other um, uh, 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 groups of people that have common experiences to this, but in a different way. So really working for us here, it was KPAC, the Congressional Asian and Pacific American, you know, members of Congress uh, uh, um, caucus, working with the Black caucus and the, Latin, uh, the Hispanic caucus, together the Tri caucus coming together mm -hmm. to say we stand against anti-Asian hate and bringing those communities together 
to work together to solve this problem. Um, and so that it's not just an Asian issue that only Asian Congress people and the senators care about. This is an issue that all Americans should care about, mm -hmm. um, especially those in the Black Caucus and the Latinx Caucus and the LGBTQ Caucus. So that's another thing that we that that is our role as well. Um, and then the third is just to continue to help educate the American people uh, on the fact that this is existing and continue to fight it um, uh, every chance that we get, whether it's through legislation, whether it is through appropriations, whether it is through the executive branch, making sure that we hold um, you know, the executive branch accountable for fighting this, this hate and prosecuting it. And then uh, politically, we have a role to, pro to provide more representation. Uh, one of the things that I'm working on right now is to say to you know, the Biden administration, hey, your next Supreme Court justice nominee after this one should be Asian, should be AANHPI. We need representation too, and to get more AANHPIs to run for office so that we have greater representation in all branches of government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I just wanna note that we can't forget your and Senator Maisie's role in you know, getting an appointment at the White House, right? It's a role that's never existed, a senior advisor to the president. Um, and we have um, Erica Moritsugu in that role, all, all thanks to your leadership and really thinking about how to leverage your position and your positionality to really further um, visibility and, and, and engagement for our community. So I wanna thank you for that and continuing that work. I just want to remind everybody that, you know, this is stuff you've been working on, you've, you've done um, previously as well. So, um, we have a few questions here from uh, our audience. I think we have time for maybe a couple. Um, so the first question is, what is a role, what is the philanthropy's role in addressing this topic? What are specific reforms and actions to take? When you say philanthropy, are you talking about um, helping not-for-profits or are you talking about personal contributions? Because there's a couple of things that can be done. Um, I'll yeah address them both. Obviously, not-for-profits have a role to play in the local communities um, to fund all sorts of programs that would empower the local AAH and AANHPI community and to also fight the increased hate. Um, if you're also talking about giving, uh, one of the things that we can do is to try to get greater representation in our government at all levels, whether it is supporting a political candidate that's running for office or, importantly, supporting interns. One of the things, one of the paths to power in Washington, D.C., that has been the path to power in Washington, D.C. for over 200 years, has been this idea that um, the old boys network, right, the, the, the connection. So many of the, my white male senator colleagues were pages and interns here 20, 30, 40 years ago um, because their fathers were either themselves senators or were friends with a senator or were business partners with a senator who then got them the internship. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those internships lead to jobs and, and you know, that, that, that stair step gets you into the pipeline into leadership so that you come back later and you run and you become a senator. So there's lots of male senators right now who were pages at one point. I don't know of any female senators who were page, but there's a lot of men who were. Um, so one of the things that I've been doing, speaking with various AANHPI communities is like, um, uh, uh, like the Korean American community is a good one. I said, listen, I only have a, so, a finite budget. Um, so I can only have so many interns in my office that I can pay for. But if you want to fund an intern where they can come to Washington DC and work in my office for three months and they can stay with a Korean American family who acts as chaperones and you pay them a small stipend so that they can you know, eat and, and be here for three months, raise the, raise the money. It might cost, you know, it might cost you a thousand dollars a month to have somebody here and they can stay with a, a local family and then they can come and work in my office. And then they are now a congressional fellow or a congressional intern that goes on their resume. They make the connections and they are now on that path. They're in the pipeline that someday, hopefully they become like a Ben Roadside, my Korean American, um, you know, a, a legislative director that's one of the top jobs you can have in Washington on the mm -hmm. legislative director for a senator. Um, we got to put people into that pipeline. So that philanthropy part of it is help those communities that are helping in the local communities, but don't forget that 
again, I'm going to quote Speaker Pelosi, if you don't have a seat at the table, you are on the menu. We got to get people in the pipeline so that they have seats at the yeah. table. And you can do it one of two ways, either running for office or the professional staff. And, and, and it's not just politically, but also in those C-suites. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't, Fortune 500 companies have very few Asian Americans in those top offices. We, we are overrepresented in the professional ranks. We are overrepresented as, as the accountants and the senior vice presidents, but we never get to be on the board or the presidents or the CEOs or the COOs or the CFOs. We're always at that corporate vice president level. Mm -hmm. And so we got to get people into the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we can help one another and, 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 and get that going. It's why Maisie and I pushed so hard to get more political appointees at the cabinet level position. We have lots of Asian Americans who are deputy directors and mm -hmm. undersecretaries, you know, but they never get selected. They just get selected for the jobs where they have to do the hard work, but they don't get to be the face. And yeah. we have to get them into those positions. Yeah, and only reinforcing the stereotype about Asian American women, right? So that is really awesome. I mean, I think those are just really great ideas. Obviously, I think just from my perspective as somebody leading a nonprofit, a social justice organization, I think there needs to be a recognition from philanthropy that the Asian American community has been sorely under-resourced, underfunded for many years, and that you know, there needs to be some radical shifts in how we resource our communities and our community organizations and our, our community leaders, you know, the, the pipeline you're talking about, right? Like it's also at the community level, like it's not just an extra, you know, few percentages here and there, like we need some seismic changes in investment in our community in order to, you know, make sure we get the support and have, you know, at the end of the day, it is about, when we are represented well and our views are at the table from the get-go, that's how we will stop this stuff, right? It's not by some sort of miracle wand shaking that the White House is going to do. Like, that's not how violence stops. That's not how stereotypes and racism stops. So um, I so appreciate your perspective because you're absolutely right. Like, we need more folks in the pipeline and being able to get to seats of making decisions. And that takes all of us, right? Of, folks like you offering internships and, you know, people in the community doing what we need to do and can do in the advocacy community as well. So thank you so much, Senator. And so sorry, folks, we didn't get to all of your questions, but um, I just want to thank you for joining us. And just if you have one closing thought for us before you go, I mean, this has been such a treat, you know, I feel like we don't get to often have these like professional and personal conversation. And so I'd love to ask you for one closing thought before you go? I think to maintain the connection to continue to uh, reach out and, and, and touch those folks that are uh, 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 in positions of power. You know, there, there are lots of organizations right now. There are organizations of um, federal employees, Asian American um, federal employees that you should be reaching out to. We have to build our networks and our networks have to go beyond just our own flavor of Asian, right? It can't just be Korean Americans helping Korean Americans, right? We've got to help all flavors of Asians working together. Um, and, and so there are those organizations that exist and we just have to learn to work across those lines and together more often because it's really easy for us to just talk to those same affinity groups that are part of our own, you know, I call them flavors of Asian. It's probably not politically correct. Eth ethnicities, yes. <laughs> ethnicities, you know, you said that the Thais only talk to the Pies, the South Asians only talk to the South, you know, but, but we have to work and we're not, we can't be competing against each other. Um, and that is especially hard within the Asian American, uh, Native Hawaiian and Asian American community because there are so many different versions of us that it is, it is easy to get, to get, um, brainwash into thinking it's a zero-sum game that if the south asians get something then we then nobody else gets anything mm -hmm. um, we shouldn't be fighting over the one slice of pie that's labeled the diversity slice we should all get a slice of the pie right Everybody, i love it you know so that's just right. remember that and working with each other and not against each other because because yeah. the way it works and the way the environment works is they want us to fight each other yep that that's right that's the threat and we yeah, have to exactly expand not get caught up in the competition. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, um, Senator, for, for your words today. And 
Um, and on behalf of the center and myself, thank you all for joining us today. And again, reminder that the full report is available at naphoff.org and um, the latest updates and upcoming events. Um, if you're interested, you can get on our mailing list for all of that information and follow us on social media channels. And um, we're so sorry we didn't get to all of the questions and we hope that you'll continue to engage with us and further the conversation um, offline. Thank you so much for being here and be well.